Jeremy Della, who needs no introduction whatsoever, however I do. And my name is Beth Greenacre. Um, I am an art, an art advisor, curator, consultant, and like Jeremy, a graduate from the Courtauld. Um, I thought we'd just start with me raving about your work okay, and telling so you... you do that the whole time if you want. Okay, so, well, we are going to talk mainly about your work and right. touch a little bit on your time at the Courtauld. Um, but as I say, Jeremy needs no introduction. We're all very familiar with his exhibitions and his um, representation of Britain at, the, at Venice a few years back. Um, but for me, your work has always personally resonated as a social inquiry and as a celebration of British culture, particularly vernacular British culture. Um, and I was just about to tell you about all of the ties that I think may possibly unite us. So I was thinking about if I were to draw a diagram similar to that which you drew before, or the, the diagram that preceded um, acid brass, brass yeah. it would include brass bands from the northwest of England, Good. Shelley's nightclub, circa 1990 to 1992, which was lesser known, I'm sure, amongst most members of the crowd, but was um, very active for those years in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, what else? David Bowie. Yeah. Well, you work with him. I worked with David for the better part of my career, so close to 20 years. Yeah. Um, what else was there that united us, I think? The court old. The court old, of course. That old thing. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I was there a long time before you. I was there in 85. No. So, and graduated in, in 88. 88. I was a BA. So I was at the old court hall. The, yeah. The very eccentric building, full of kind of quite eccentric people. It sort of mirrored the people in the building, seemed to go together very well. So I was sort of thrown into that. I didn't really know what to make of it, to be honest. Still and, don't. And we were just talking it. about sort of your path into that. So pre the courthold, whilst I was dancing the night away in well, <laughs> Stoke on Trent before my courthold years, well, if you, you were. Well, if you grow up in London and you have all these amazing museums near to where, near where I live, there's the Imperial War Museum and the Horniman's Museum. And I just started liking going to museums. I didn't really like sports, so museums were kind of the playing field for me. And my dad encouraged that, because he didn't like sport either, so we just kind of... But he did like art. He did. I mean, he didn't go to university, or he did an open university degree, and he, he did went to open university, he did that in the late 70s, but he liked art, and he was quite happy for me to be interested in it, so he encouraged that. I mean, I never made art, really. I couldn't, and at my secondary school, I went to a terrible private school called Dulwich College in <laughs> South London. It's much better now. And, and there the art teacher hated me, like, within minutes, so that never really was going to happen. So art history was the next best thing. So did you think at that point that you did want a career as an artist? Or was no. it your time at the Courthold that encouraged you to think about the possibilities? Well, the Courthold, there, there was a very special moment for me at the Courthold, which I try not to talk about anymore because I've kind of worn it out as a story. But... Uh, Sarah Wilson showed me an invitation to an Andy Warhol exhibition at Anthony Doffe yeah. in 1986. She didn't give me the invitation, she just showed it to me. And I had to, to memorise <laughs> where it was and what time. And I went to the opening and, that's, and I met him for two days later. And then I sort of did all those things. You know. And it's, quite, it's a story that I'm familiar with. So you actually ended up heading out to New York and spending time with him in the fact that... Yeah, I spent a bit of time. I mean... I think it meant a lot more to me than it meant to him, frankly. But uh, it, was, uh, it was a very important thing for a 20-year-old to do. And, and it just showed me what, the, what an artist could be. What an artist could be. So yes. we, and thinking about Andy and his kind of disruption of the hierarchies within the art world. Yes. That was something I presume really interested you. Well, and also his interest, uh, yes, exactly, interest in music, publishing, film. It was like anything. You could do whatever you wanted. And I just thought, well, if he can do it, and it looked like a lot of fun, kind of the world he'd created for himself, not that he was necessarily a happy person, but I just thought, well, you can really make your own world, and, which is what he did. And uh, so that was a great inspiration. 
And also thinking about, I mean, you just talked about the institutions that you visited as a child. Yeah. And then the institution that you found yourself in. Yes. But I think of your work as being very much outside of the institution. And that's also what Andy was doing, I guess, with yeah. the factory. Or maybe he was creating his own institution. Well, I went from, you know, I went from a private school that looked a bit like this, weirdly enough. Dulles College looks like this. Um, my my it, high school did not look like this. No. <laughs> And then I went to an institution like the Quarter, which wasn't actually that different in a way. It was just kind of a lot, a lot of lessons and classes and homework. And so I was kind of used to that. But I'm always, whenever I'm within an, an institution, you, you end up trying to fight against it whatever, in whatever way you can, and, and uh, even in little ways, small ways. So I, I did that. But I suppose I was used to strange institutions. So the Quarter really, for me, was just no kind of normal <laughs> in a way. But I'm sure for some people, they were quite shocked by it, I think, when they were there. Someone went and left the same day on the first day. I remember someone just came and just, just like, I can't Had they not done the open day? I don't know what they'd done, but they'd really, when they saw who they were going to be studying with, you know, you're studying with 23 people. We're spending the next three years with, and, you know, or whatever. And I think they thought, well, kind of, I'm out of here. So um, they did that. So thinking about your art today and your practice today, I mm. think it is very much, um, it's, I've always admired it for its inclusivity. Yes. Which is um, something that... Well, I, I, think, I think there's two ways of looking at that. It's, it is inclusive because I need people to make it yeah. for and with me. So I'm including people to... It's, you know, it's a selfish reason to be inclusive in a sense. I'm just sort of knocking myself down a bit. But it, there is that reason. But also I'm quite open to who can see it and mm. I'm interested in who can experience it and who goes to things and what they make of it. So I like that. Well, I'm thinking particularly about the work that you've produced for the public realm. Yes. And I love doing. I love working in the public realm because you really never, you can't, you lose control of the reaction of the people. You can't control the weather. That's the first thing, and then you don't know really what people are going to make of things and how they'll interpret it. So for me, it's it's quite exciting. Can you talk a little bit about the recent collaboration you did with the uh, National Theatre that was to yes. commemorate the well, well, it was to commemorate the first day, the hundredth anniversary, of the first day of the Battle of the Somme. It was a bit of a mouthful. But uh, it was just an idea to have people dressed as soldiers, just inhabiting public places in the United Kingdom. People go to work and they see a group of 30 soldiers just standing in a railway station and then they disappear, they get on trains, they, you know, the soldiers get on trains, they travel around Britain. It's kind of virus. Artwork is a virus. And of course then you have the mirroring virus of the of social media which spreads the word as well. So it's a way to really... Um, and again, a lack of control on your behalf. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's something really... Well, and also, you know, I was putting those young men, and it was mainly young men, into quite a difficult position, potentially. We thought they'd be attacked and sworn at, and, uh, you know, potentially we had all these these uh, scenarios that we had to do scenario planning and all these w protocols if people were abusive and so on, but actually... And you didn't receive it. No, there's a bit of swearing in Northern Ireland, but that's, you know, it had to go to Northern Ireland. There some people swore at them, you know, but that was it. So it was, it was kind of amazing. I and mean, it was a week after Brexit, if you can remember that far back. Uh, it, was a 20, it was the 1st of July 2016, and I think people were just, just frazzled by then by the result, but also what happened the week after when May became Prime Minister. And so people were just like going out of their minds, I think. And this was maybe a, some sort of a reminder of what sacrifice actually is, what it means you know, when you sacrifice your life for your country, as opposed to what some politicians were doing, with sacrificing their country for their careers. And I think people understood that. Or they just wanted to have some kind of emotional outpouring. Mm. Mm. And thinking about some of the other um, collaborations and major performances that you've done, they've often been of political moments. Yes. So obviously the famous one being the Battle of Orgreave. Grieve. Um, I'm thinking also about the Acid House or the Rave moment yes. as something that is a political um, yeah. situation or proposition. How important is that to you? Well, I always liked history. Yeah. As a, as a child, that was something I really loved. And uh, recent history I'm very interested in. Obviously. Is that because it's directly linked to yourself and your place in the world? Because that's another thing that I think about with your work is how it allows us to reread our position mm -hmm. today. Yes, and maybe with recent history it's unwritten. It hasn't been formulated right. or solidi solidified so you can play around with it. The clay has not hardened. 
so you can go in and just make a mess with it and then see what happens. So there is that element, I think. So, but maybe, I mean, going back to art history, as I feel we mm -hmm. should. Yeah. <laughs> that's why we're here, I suppose. But was, I suppose what Occulto, you know, the idea of history painting was interesting. I did bar Baroque art, so we studied um, Velasquez, obviously. And so that was important to see history painting, mm -hmm. these grand mm -hmm. paintings. And, and the Baroque was a very interesting moment in history, as a, a, in art history, as a, an attempt, if I'm correct, you can correct me, an attempt for, of the Catholic Church to re-engage with an audience and make these works that were multidisciplinary, that were, were using people as models who, who were not perfect right. people, so with Caravaggio, and you had this idea of, of really trying to grab an audience and drag them into a situation, drag them into a scenario. Which sounds very much like your own practice. Well, weirdly, yes. So, I mean, I suppose I did learn from the Baroque in yeah. that way about how to communicate through scenarios through theatricality and all those things. And I always think of the Brock as being very much tailored towards the audience and that physical yes. experience, which is also how I think about your practice as well. Yeah. At what point, when you're thinking about a new work, does the audience come in as a factor? Does it, or, uh, does it, or do they not? Well, the, f the first audience is myself. Yeah. And then, yes, of course, you want to know what you, the experience for the public is very important with some works more than others. You really want to, you do, you, you do think about who's going to see it and in what circumstances, especially when one with the soldiers, the World War I piece. That was really important because I really wanted to sort of, I wrote in, I had a big notebook and one of the things I wrote in it was I want to make children cry because I actually really did want to really scare children. I don't think I did. Sure, I'll tell you what, I watched a video recently, only this week and I cried. It may have but been a jet lag, but... <laughs> yes. A lot of people, some, some people did... Uh, did cry. Uh, uh, I don't know why, really. I hope it wasn't for sentimental reasons, but it, for some it might have been. But it was meant to be in, kind of an intense experience, maybe, yeah. for some people. Yeah. And then on the flip side, thinking about your interest in music and how music um, can m be a marker for a political moment. Yes. Like rave culture, like other th moments that yeah. you have... Um, Visited, often that's quite a joyous. You, you, you're, it's a very joyous sort of interpretation of that. Well, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a terrible pessimist, so I need something to keep me going in a way. And the music's great for that, isn't it? It really lifts any situation. So it, for me, it's very important to work with musicians as well as music. I love being around musicians. I love being in a recording studio. I love being in rehearsals. Just work with an orchestra in Cologne. So I just love the, the just being around all that talent, basically. I love being around that, tuning up, all of that. I can't get enough of it. But also, I, you know, as a child, I, I, I kind of interpreted the world through music. It was how I made sense of the world, and yeah. it still is in a way. So for me, music is super important. I'm just making this film about... I was talking about it earlier, about Parliament Square in the last six months, about Brexit and about the far right, who have been there a lot, but also there's other, but there's quite a lot of moments of music in this film, strange enough. Um, good and bad. You could call it bad music because of like rallying what's going music. On. Mm -hmm. Rallying music. Well, yes, there's some pipe flute bands from right. uh, loyalist flute bands came on the 29th of March, and everyone just, you know, you're just attracted to it, and people march. You know, you, this is human nature, we as we know. But when you look at it again, everyone's wearing black and they're sort of marching and it's. It's not great, really. Um, so, but there is music in this film quite a lot. Because often it says a lot more than a, people can when they're talking about stuff. Yeah, yeah. It actually it speaks so much more eloquently for human beings. And so, and that film is you're editing it at the moment. I'm editing. When it at do the we get the opportunity to see it? Well, I don't know because it's going to be in Austria in a festival. Okay. So, but why Austria? Well, they wanted me to make a film about... Uh, well, it was all got a bit complicated. It was meant to be interviewing John le Carre, and he sort of ducked out at the last minute. But he was in Graz as a very, very early on in his career as a sort of a spy, basically. Right. And, uh, but I, know, I knew I wanted to make a film about now, Britain now, and, and, and Austria post-war, and Europe post-war. But that's sort of gone out the window, really, so it's just about now. But having said that, almost every person you talk to on the, on the right talks about the Second World War uh, or talks about the past in a certain way or uses the language of the Second World War, Al without, almost without exception and without any prompting. So it's deeply ingrained, even though a lot of them weren't alive 
when it was happening. And going back to the audience and thinking about how and when that should this film should be seen in London or in the yes. UK or toured around the UK well, would be more interesting, perhaps. Do you, what, how do you think the shift will be with well, the I audience? It's a, good question. it's a good question, because I'm sort of making a little film for Europe to, to see what's going on, and then I might show it in America. I think that would be quite interesting in America, yeah. but also in Britain. Because the, the people I interviewed are not the people that will be interviewed on the news. It, uh, it's, they're quite fringe, and also their views are such that you probably wouldn't have them on the television, really, because you, you'd have to contradict them or just cut them out of an interview because they're just saying such strange things. And to be honest, I haven't chosen those people. I randomly go up to people and talk to them. And a lot of them have quite odd views about things. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of anti-Semitism. For the, on Brexit, far right, as you can imagine, there's a lot, uh, and that comes out very clearly. And what about if you bring it in, going back to the institution, what happens when you bring it into the institution? Because one of the things that I think about a lot is social mobility and social diversity in the art world, yes, and how there are various restrictions. Can you talk to that in terms of what happens when you bring a film like that that is has political content to a museum going or institution well, it, going audience? Well, it depends where you're going to show it. I think some museums are brilliant at having young, diverse audiences and others, I suspect in Graz in Austria, well, it's not going to be so good. <laughs> but if they took it to Tate Modern or Tate Britain, yeah. you get school groups, you get everybody, you know, there's quite, I mean, that's the brilliant thing about museums in London, at least. The, the fact that they're free is just like full of people all the time. I know, which obviously sends some people insane, but I mean, I think that's a good thing. So, yes, of course, you're speaking to... But now you put things online. The film I just made about dance, music, culture is going to be on the telly next week, which is great. So, so that's an hour-long film it's about that you made in yes. collaboration again with Freeze, I think it was. With Freeze, it? but it's weird, actually, because it's, it it's about the time when I was at the Courtauld. But yeah. it's not about the Courtauld, you'd be uh, upset <laughs> to hear. It's about other stuff that was going on. It's a sort of history of Britain told through music, in a way, or how the relationship between music and history and technology uh, have, have intermingled and it's a, maybe it's a way of sta stepping back and looking at history a moment in British youth culture and looking at it within the context of what's happened before during and after in terms of British history and social change uh, so but yes the first minute of the film and the last minute last two minutes of the film the filmed in the club that you went to you might even be in this film that's what's so so incredible. I'm going to be watching you should <laughs> you should because you might be in it and I've just been told that we need to wind it up. So, Jeremy Della, outside of the institution next week and in your living room... 3rd on of August. OK. It's called Everybody in the Place. Let's the go. Film. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>